last Saturday as my son and I were sitting in a hotel uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, we were watching a football game. I believe it was uh, between Auburn and Alabama last week. And there was one particular play in the fourth quarter where the receiver caught the ball. And it looked to me that he stepped on the line when he caught it. But the referee said that his foot was on the inside of the line. And they called it a reception. <laughs> they stopped the whole game in the middle of an exciting game. And the referee went over and got up under this little box that they had with a little sheet over his head with earphones on. And he reviewed the play by himself. He sat there and looked at the play and examined it. And while he was looking, I was wondering why he had those earphones on. And I found out that uh, I thought somebody was talking to him from upstairs. But actually, they say they put the earphones on so they could block out the noise of the people. Sometimes they will ask for the upstairs to help them review it. I don't know what the NFL does because I'm not watching them until they get that kneeling thing situated. But I'm, I'm all in the college. I'm a big college fan this year. I'm really in tune with what they're doing. But he came back out the boot and said, after further review, we found out that he did step on the line and we put the ball back on the 27-yard line. I started thinking about that referee that for him to examine what was going on, he had to remove himself from everybody else. He had to go into a little closet by himself so that he would remove the noise of other people, the impressions of other ideas, and even the consciousness of other folks and get just between him and the play and make a decision. You know, some of us never really get into God's word because our word is so contingent on what other people think that all through our lives we have so much noise around us that we never get quiet enough to just get along with you and God and let God talk to you about what he wants you to do in your life. That if you are always dependent on somebody else's impression or opinion, you will be a slave to what they think instead of what God thinks in your life. And I think that this is one of those texts where God requires you and I to step away from people, to even step away from Sundays, to even step away from your hour and 15-minute service and start looking at yourself to say, am I getting in the way of God's movement because of my tradition? Okay, let me give it to you another way. That traditions are good, but traditions can be become, become dangerous when your tradition has to check with your past to get approval to move. Okay, let me, get, let me give it to you another way. That if you are more dependent on yesterday to make a decision on tomorrow, your traditions will divorce you from the opportunity to see a fresh move from God. Paul is simply saying in this text, sounds like a difficult text, but it's actually simple in its origin because Paul is teaching people who are coming all into one assembly with different ideas of what church ought to look like. Some folks come from a Jewish understanding of who God is. They don't eat bacon. They don't eat pork chops. They don't eat pork. They, some of them would even reject all type of meat. And they would come in and say, yeah, we serve Jesus, but in the process of you serving Jesus, you need to give up meat. These Gentiles would come into church, and they would come into church after cooking off a pound of bacon with lips so greasy it looked like that they put armor all on them. And they coming in the church and said, it ain't nothing wrong with having a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich before I get to church. And they were saying to the folks who eat meat, or who don't eat meat, you ought to stop that. You ought to start enjoying everything that God has in store. Then Paul said, not only that, some of y'all are keeping the Sabbath still. You're holding on to the Sabbath, serving God, which is Saturday. And some of you, 
are bringing in Sunday as the day to worship. He says, whichever day you worship, if you do it to the glory of God, leave them alone. Okay, come here, come here, come here. What Paul is saying is that each one of us have to decide what's truth compared to tradition. And if your tradition gets in the way of his truth, you need to let your tradition go and follow his word. I was teaching this to the Wednesday morning Bible class, and the Wednesday morning Bible class, they tripped me out because that's a historical society. That's our Smithsonian Bible class. I mean, they, they have so much wealth of knowledge, and I was teaching this lesson, and I was telling them, I remember one time in church, at the old church, not, not old gardens, but a long time ago when I was about 12 years old, uh, church almost stopped because a brother got behind the communion table without a towel. Come on, Deacon Smith. You remember. You were there with me. I almost shut down church. Y'all remember the communion table? Y'all remember that table that was right there that said, do this? Come on, y'all. In remembrance of me. That thing was so heavy, you thought Jesus was in it? And, and then if you bumped up again, it was against it. It was a sin. You couldn't move it. Uh, all the time you could move it if we were having a choir. And it would take 20 folks to get that wood table. Because we act like that was sacred. And one time a guy got up behind the, the uh, thing. He had a jacket on and had a blue shirt on, but he didn't have a towel. Almost shut church down. And those, those sisters and those brothers in that class said to me, well, that ain't nothing. I remember the first time that somebody took the lid off the communion and then prayed. Where you were supposed to leave the lid on and pray. Somebody said, well, I'll take you back further. I remember when they used to have a sheet over. Y'all ain't going to have church with me. I had a sheet over the communion tray because they couldn't afford lids, and the only reason they had a sheet over the thing was because they didn't want flies to be eaten on the communion. Okay, y'all going to go back. One sister said, I'll go back even to eight or nine. I'll go back even further. I remember the first time they stopped wearing white gloves and stood over the communion and said, Lord, you know. If it was that dwelling place. And the whole time while we're fighting over how to do communion, we forget why we do communion. You fighting over if you ought to have gloves and have a sheet over and have a communion tray or have a gold communion uh, vessels and you miss that he died. While you're talking about how to do it, you miss the purpose behind doing it. And traditions are good unless traditions get in the way of truth. And some of us hadn't even grown in our personal lives because you're trying to be your mama. Some of us can't grow because you're trying to keep the tradition of your daddy. Some of us can't explore a new job because we are so stuck in our past that we keep our future a prison to what God is trying to do. It's all through the Bible of how people had to shake off their past to get to their promise. Y'all remember when Saul, when, when David showed up and said, I'll fight Goliath? It's more to the story than those five stones. David said, before he got there, Saul said, where are you going? He said, I'm going out to fight this giant because God told me I can conquer him. He said, what's your resume? He said, well, I've already whooped a lion and I've already beat up a bear and with my God that's who he is. I, I think my God is a way maker, miracle worker. And Saul said, well, let me, let me give you my arm, my armor. And David said, I can't wear it. And Saul said, but this is what worked for me. So I'm going to pass on what worked for me, and you need to make yourself uncomfortable until it works for you. David said, I don't need your armor. That's what you needed. He said, I can do more with these five songs than you could do with some, some of us are uncomfortable because you're trying to carry what your mama carried, and it ain't, you ain't in the same season. And churches are dying all over the place because they're trying to hold on to Big Mama's religion. Y'all not hear me. One day my son and I were in the car, and, and I love 
uh, how my son views God. He views him differently. He was listening to a Lecrae song about God. And Lecrae was tearing it up. I wouldn't understand nothing that Lecrae was saying because he was talking so fast. But when, when my son told me what it was, he was talking about how God died for him. And he was using the word grace. He kept using the word grace in the song and grace in the song. And it was a rap song. But he was grace, grace, grace statement, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. And it was loud, and the beat was loud, and my son was understanding every word. And all the Cray was doing was talking to him like Amazing Grace used to talk to me. Y'all don't want to have church. I can't force my Amazing Grace on him because it's a different season. And if you want to live a dormant, dead life, keep trying to bring... 20 year of your history into your present. People who stay dead are people who are unwilling to change. And everybody in here, you're going to have to change if you don't want to. You know how I know you're changing? Go get your high school picture. And put it up next to you. You have done everything you could spend. Countless daughters had countless surgeries and you still And the church is struggling because we're trying to keep Amazing Grace and marry it to Lecrae. And in the process of us fighting, like Paul said, we miss who Jesus is. We miss how Jesus is trying to express himself and do a new thing. Paul says, first of all, don't fight over stuff that doesn't have anything to do with you getting close to Jesus. Okay, let me give it to you again. He said, some of y'all worship on Saturday. I know this is going to tear up your theology. But he said, if they do it to God and they believe in Jesus Christ, leave them alone. I ain't always been here. I, when I start studying the word for me and stop studying it to convince folks across the street to be like me, the word started working on me. I wasn't reading scriptures to convince them because I was trying to convince them and I hadn't gotten convinced myself yet. Paul says, if your homeboy don't eat meat, and he only eats vegetables, and he does it to God, don't invite him over to your barbecue. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, it's funny, but it's true. And then don't try to convince him your way is the only way. Because it don't have nothing to do with Jesus. What he says is, however you do it, first of all, he said, the thing you need to do is get convinced that your way is right yourself. Read Romans 14, 1 through. He said, you can be convinced that if Sunday is your day, do it with all your heart. But don't condemn somebody else who is a believer. Now, first of all, you got to understand, I'm going to let you go, who is a believer. The Bible says a believer is somebody who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in that belief, you also believe that he died on that old rugged cross. And he was buried and rose on the third day, and he's on the right hand of the Father. That's what belief is. When we get past that, we got some negotiables we can work on. Uh, um, I was telling 8, uh, eight o'clock, and I was telling Wednesday morning that uh, when you start looking at how God expresses himself, it forces you to do stuff that you have never done before or stuff you used to do that has become relevant again. Back in the 80s, 90s, there was no need for us to have night service. We had it when we didn't need it. Because back in that day, you couldn't do anything on Sunday. You couldn't buy a car. You couldn't go to a store. The only place you could go was Wyatt's. Come on, you about to show your age. Piccadilly. 
uh, uh, red lobster. Come on, no, I don't think red lobster. It was sizzler. Y'all ain't going to pray for me for a while. Best, bar uh, best baked potato bar in the world. A sizzler, that's all you could do on Sunday. Now you can do anything on Sunday. So what the world is doing is putting our babies' games on Sunday. Activities are on Sunday. 40% of downtown dollars is operational right now. That, that they said in seven years that you will be able to pick your weekends. So weekends won't be Saturday and Sunday. Weekends will be the two days you choose. Because if you can work on Sundays, because they're doing that to try to decrease traffic, what was not relevant might be relevant again. That Sunday night service might be a necessity. Y'all see how quiet it got? Because it doesn't bother you as long it doesn't affect you. What if they can't come on Sundays? How bad would it be to have a Saturday night service as long as it's trying to get people who don't believe to start believing? What if they work on Saturday and Sunday? What if we had a Monday night service? I know, I know you don't, you, cause you didn't see that in the Bible. Uh, and so you say, I ain't coming to that one. Uh, but, but what if somebody had to get Jesus in a way you didn't get it? Because sometimes we hide Jesus under our issues because we don't want Jesus to affect our lives. When we were, when we were at the hotel, people, we, we bought a van. Uh, for the church before we got a building. I remember it was an uproar. Why are we buying a van? We don't even have a building yet. The people who were fussing about the van were people who had cars. So I went to all the people who were fussing and said, okay, here's a list of 10 folks. Who will you pick up? Next thing I know, Pastor, you know, we really need, the Lord spoke to me last night, but we really need to get a van for the folks who ain't got as long as your Jesus don't affect your life, you'll make your issues more important than you changing. So Paul says in Romans chapter 14, he says this, verse number 10, so why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, the time we're going to have unity is when we all have to kneel down in front of Jesus and say, you are our God. He says, every tongue will confess and every knee shall bow that you are our God. Yes, each of us, verse number 12, will have to give a personal account to God. So stop condemning each other and decide instead to live in such a way that you will cause, won't cause another believer to stop. The key word to me in this text is believer. Paul keeps repeating this word believer because Paul is saying, stop wasting your time trying to convince people that God already has. He said, start spending time with people who don't believe. Okay, okay, it's going to get quiet, but I'm going to give it to you anyway because that's my job. When I go into my barber shop, and I don't know if my barber might be here, but when I go in there, there's a lot of people that come into the barber shop, young guys who don't believe in God. And that's my place. I do more ministry there than I do here. I don't spend my time with the barbers who already believe and go to church. I spend my time with the folk who questioning, is there a God? So what I do is I get there early to their dismay. One, one time they locked the doors, they let Blake in and locked me out. Because <laughs> I go up there and I act, I, I act a fool. I mean, I'm at the barbershop. That's what the barbershop, I grew up like that. That's, that's where you score on folks. I mean, I swing that door open. No, you didn't. You know, this one guy wears older stuff. And I said, uh, look, at, look at the golden child. Y'all remember Eddie Murphy? He always wears one of them hats. Like, I said, brother, you stuck back in the stuff. We go back and forth. And I remember one time they asked me, do you act like this at church? I said, even worse. 
I said, you got to be strong to go to this church because if you wear something crazy, we're going to score on you. you know? We love you, but brother, I wouldn't wear it, but it looks good on you, you know. <laughs> That's the type of church we are. We love it. But they came and started visiting church because they wanted to see why you act the same way everywhere. Because they have been told that God doesn't change. We lied to them and gave scriptures that says God's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. So we present, we present to them a stagnant, out-of-date God. Come here. Y'all done got quiet. My old church folks done got quiet. We, God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. So what we present to people who don't believe is God never changes. We never read the verse before that and the verse after. We take that one verse and we present that because that verse before says that you can count on God at the beginning of your life, through your life, and to the end of your life because God is the same. Just like he made you a promise at the beginning, he makes you a promise at the end. It ain't about your church life. My God never changes. So we present that to the world, so we present a God that's out of date with today because we don't let God express himself in this season. That's why your grandchildren don't come to church. That's why when your children become a, a teenager, they stop coming to church. You know why? Because you're trying to convince them the only way to get to God is the way you got to God in 1975. So you tell them, turn off Lecrae, because that ain't Mom Mabel. And I know people who will, won't let their children come to a certain church and would prefer them staying at home more than hearing Jesus because they don't like what that church... I'm telling you the truth, and you just don't want to hear it. That they would prefer them not having any God than to have some type of God because the God that's presented ain't the flavor they savor. Some of you have been told don't come here because <laughs> they ain't doing it right and you've learned more about Jesus in three months than you've learned in 30 years. You know why? Because everyday life is Jesus. You keep on just worshiping on Sundays. I worship every day. Because when I wake up on Monday, I look at my hands and I can't believe it. They look new and I look at my feet. If you only worshiping for one day, I wonder if you are a worshiper. So how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? I want to give you some practical stuff. I want you, this is your, uh, this is your go home. This is your... If you like hooping, this is your hoop. I don't condemn those who do it. I was preaching with a guy not too long ago, and that joker took us home. And I was, and unfortunately, he's supposed to put those type of guys after teaching preaching. See, I wasn't supposed to be after him, and I got up and said, now, if you expect to get what you just got, <laughs> I ain't got it. It ain't right here. Yeah, you got to have it here. I can't do it, but I can help you with your life. So, if I know my issues have gotten in front of my Jesus, and I, if I know I started worshiping my tradition, how do I work on it? Here it is right here. Last point. What you got to do is first how, learn how to extend grace, not grief. Y'all get that in your spirit. What does the grace mean? Grace means that I accept you without trying to change you. Let me get it again. I don't accept you after you've changed. I accept you where you are until God gets you to where he wants you to be. Y'all stop. Think about your family. Think about people around you who don't believe in God. Think about people around you who don't love God. What if you didn't spend Thanksgiving fussing at them about not going to church? And what if you just said, come on and get this turkey? 
this dry turkey and this stuffing that we look all forward to. And what if you didn't talk about it and started being about it? What if you came to Thanksgiving that year and stopped talking about family members who are not there and start condemning everybody you don't like? And maybe this year you got around the table and started saying, Lord, thank you for one more meal. What, what if you came to, worship, came to Thanksgiving this year and invited everybody around and Big Mama just said, hey, I just want to tell everybody in the family how God let me, to get, how God let me get to this age. Instead of saying, why did you get prayed? Why are you not working? Why are you on that stuff? What if you start letting God use you. Because he says it in the, uh, the 12th verse. He said, won't you start living it, and then you don't have to bring up your issue to prove it. H hold on, Jada, because i got to give them this, because they won't hear it once you start playing. Hold on. I need you right there, because I'm about to go home. Look what it says. If the only people you can agree with is people who think like you think, you got shallow faith. Okay, uh -huh, this is working. If the only people who you hang around with are people who say yes to your mess, you really don't have friends. If you ain't never text somebody and said what you think about, and then when you ask them what you think about, you look at yourself in retrospect and say, yeah, I need to do. If everybody in your camp is doing what you do, you need to shift camps. You're not, you're not. Because sometimes you got to bring people around you who make you uncomfortable. Because they are challenging your thought. Okay, you're, you're not getting it. I, I got to go home. You, you're right. I'm, I'm about to let y'all go in a minute. The catch this. If you are involved with a church that can only bring in people from another church that thinks just like that church, it might be because two problems. First of all, you don't want anybody challenging your belief system. Or secondly, you ain't for sure of what you believe. If you go to a funeral and they are not of your religious circle and you shut off your ears, you might have shut off your ears from a blessing because you don't like the messenger. If your co-worker is speaking truth to power, but because they are a servant and you a manager and you've never been able to listen to a subordinate, they might have more knowledge than your degrees. But you shut it up because they have learned how to stay married and you can't stay in a relationship. It's people who come around you who try to challenge your thoughts, not your belief, because your belief is foundation. It is believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's foundation. That's non negotiable. But past that, when you really are convinced, like Paul said, of what you believe, then you are not uncomfortable when you get around people who don't believe. The only time you get comfortable is when you don't know what you believe. So what you do is you run from anybody who challenges your belief because you are standing not on solid foundation, you are standing on sinking sand. Yeah, yeah. Nobody in here does exactly what they did 10 years ago. You can't even raise children the same way you raised them. When we grew up, there wasn't no phone. There was no games to play in the house. You went outside. You stayed outside all day. Y'all not going to pray with me for a while? Your parents forced you to go outside. And you didn't come back in until lunch or until the street light came on. You have to push kids out the house now because they got Xbox, they got new box, they got red box, they got purple box, and everything is for them in their hands, and you're trying to raise kids like your mama did. And these kids have more knowledge. We were not smart. 
Come on now, y'all, 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 y'all making church hard. Yeah, that, that, our, we were not smart when we were growing up. You know why? Because we didn't have privy to information. We knew how to commit because our life was filled with commitments. This generation has more information but less stability. We had stability but less information. So what you have to do is take what you had and now take what you know and create a new paradigm that never questions the foundation of your belief. So how do I deal with people who are different than me? Here it is right here. I'm going to give you these three, and I'm going uh, to cut. Cut the corner. Look what it says. Number one, grace principles. You need to pull this. This is your takeaways. Pull you out your phone. Pull out your note. This, this is what we're going to go home with. A life of grace begins with mutual acceptance. I want you to get this. Even though you are different than me, I accept you for who God made you. And I'm not trying to make you become me. Think how much better your marriage would be if you did that. Okay. Think about how much better your job would be if you did that. Stop trying to make your coworker you. Let me give you another point. Stop trying to make your child you. Let them be who God, because you're different than your parents. My daddy wore suits when he preached. He never got up in front of the church without a tie and a suit on. I got about four suits, and I wear them for funerals. Or when I go preach at a church that requires suits. Y'all ain't going to pray with me. This is how I roll. How you see me on Monday, I would wear sweatpants if I didn't skip. But, but this is how I get down. The way I am on Sundays, I'm the same way on Saturday. Because I don't view dress as holiness. But guess what? When I go to suit churches, I wear a suit and I don't tell him, man, you ought to start wearing blue jeans. Y'all not going to pray with me for it. Not only do you need to start with mutual acceptance, that means I accept you for who God made you. And I want God to change you and not me. But look at number two, and I'm going to go. An attitude of grace requires releasing others to be who God wants them to be. Okay. Then say amen at, at uh, 8 o'clock too. Let me tell you why. Because God reveals himself to different generations in different ways. As great and as magnificent and as orally uh, sound and as strong as he was with his etymology skills, Dr. Martin Luther King wouldn't be able to exist in 2018. You know why? Because all of the information that he had, he got from God, and he exseminated to the people. In 2018, this generation would challenge him about where the mountain is instead of trusting that it's a mountain. <laughs> so if somebody today is trying to be Martin Luther King, you're trying to grab 1960 history and put it in 2018. That's who God made him to be. Y'all remember, remember that when John the Baptist was out there preaching in the wilderness? John the Baptist was weird. Man, that dude was whacked out. He was cray-cray. That joker used to eat honey and locusts. And he had camel hair. That's what he wore. I mean, he went to the store and got camel hair and wrapped it over him. And he was out there preaching the Lord. And the Bible says, brought thousands to Jesus. And the reason many people rejected him was not because of what he was saying, but because how he looked. He was preaching, preaching truth to power, but he didn't look like the package they wanted. <laughs> and some of you miss your blessing because if God doesn't reveal himself in the way that you want it, 
you dismiss it even though it could be your best blessing. Stop trying to force everybody to be who you are and let them be who God created them to be. And here it is, here it is. Y'all go ahead. Here it is. A commitment to grace forbids anyone to become a judge of another. If, if God expresses himself to you in a different way, I accept God's will on your life. If your child comes through and presents God in a different way than you've ever heard it, as long as the foundational truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that's non-negotiable. But if they do it with shorts on and it's still about Jesus, who are you to say? Because everybody in this room has had different expressions of how they ran into God. Some of us found God at church. Some of us found God at the club. Some of us found God at the wrong address. Some of us found God like I did in college on Bourbon Street, running from the police. Come on, somebody. You don't sit there and act so holy. I can't believe that. Yeah, that was me. Laying next to the car, half drunk, with another pastor that passes right down the street. He told me, stop mentioning my name. You let me confess my own thoughts. <laughs> yeah, we were together. I mean, lit, drunk. Right, I'm sorry, mama. That's where your college money went. And I came to myself. You owe me. <laughs> I was drunk. I was out there, lost. And I got in that car, laying next to that car, and I said, God, listen, this ain't for me. If you, if you help us to get out of this right now, I promise you I'll worship you. I'll do better. And right when the police were coming on horses, I remember like it was yesterday, a gentleman that I had never seen before, a, 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 a Caucasian brother came out, grabbed us, the four of us, and pushed us down an alley. That alley led to where his car was parked. We jumped in that car and we turned down Canada Street and the police turned down the other street. You know what we started singing? Waymaker. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Don't sit here and act. Miracle worker. <laughs> Come on, now. Stop being fake. I'm talking about I used to get lit. You still getting lit. That's how I found Jesus. I knew church. I knew church because I grew up in church. That's all I did was church. But church was tradition to me. Truth came when my back was against the wall. I decided that day I got I to gotta change some stuff. And I started changing. I still fell off sometimes. But I started doing better every And that's all God is asking you to do. He's not trying to make you Jesus. You can't be Jesus. You ain't good enough to be Jesus. Whatever you just thought messed you up and voided your opportunity to be Jesus. He just asking you to be the best he created you to be. And every day, every way, become more of that. That's all he's asking you to do. He's asking you to change every day because it's more than just about Sunday. How's your life? How's your way of living? You can leave here this year in 2018 better than you started. God is still using you. Little steps, little steps. Today, this is your day. Start a new day. Start a new way. Stop judging others, because while you're judging others, you never get to judge yourself. As long as I never have to look at Paul, I can look at you and say what you need to do. But one of the best seminary professors I ever had in my last class at seminary said how sad it would be for you pastors to bring thousands to Jesus 
and you don't get to meet him yourself. And he walked out the room at the age of 89. And that was his last statement to him. How sad it is for you to bring your whole family to Jesus and you lose your own son. How sad it is for you to condemn the whole world on how they ought to get to Jesus and you never met them yourself. Isn't it sad that we can usher in the foyer but we never ushered him into our lives? Isn't it sad that we can open the door but you never open the door of your heart to let him 